Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Ask the Trainer session. And today is going to be a special one because Noseman and I have a really cool guest here. And his name is Mark Potocznik. You might know him from one of our previous live streams. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? Hey, great. Thank you for having me again. Great to yeah, be here. No problem. Um, yeah, let's just keep uh, or let's just um, spend a little bit of time on housekeeping and then uh, we're going to dive into the topic of procedural shading again. So that's going to be exciting. Um, but here, what you can see already is the Maxon website. And what I always show is when you go to <laughs> events and or news and events, then you uh, will come to this little site where you can see all the events that we are either hosting as a live stream or where we attend live. Um, yeah, and it's a really cool thing to um, yeah look around and see which shows you want to attend. In case you didn't make it to one of the shows, you can always go to the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. <coughs> and on here, um, you can... Yeah, you can uh, see the recordings. You can find um, everything that we did uh, as a live stream and also a few more things. And you can catch up with everything. There's a ton of um, of uh, recordings of live streams on there and a lot of other stuff. If you're new to either Cinema 4D or Redshift or Universe, ZBrush, uh, or any of the other Maxon applications, you can always go to cineversity.maxon.net. And what you can find here is a great uh, section, which is the Getting Started series. So whenever you want to get started with uh, one of our applications, this is the place to go. Then um, on the other side, when you are a very experienced user, you can always go to the maxon.net slash certification site. And this is where we have all the information about Cinema 4D pro user and trainer certification. So if you unfold this, you will find um, a list of topics, for example, that you can explore. And uh, if you feel like you're good in all these, or if you know about all of these uh, topics, then you can take the pro user certification. And last but not least, I want to show you the Maxon Ask the Trainer exclusive wear store. And to get there, you would have to type in a passcode. And the passcode will be shared in the chat in a second. And are you going to take care of that, Noseman? I wasn't paying attention. So I, uh, Did you freeze? The spooky? The spooky? Wait, let, let me see. I'm I might oh he's back. He's back. Yeah, yeah. The spooky renders. Yeah, exactly. This all right, and there it is. There it is. And spooky yeah, render. I'm gonna the links are also gonna be in the chat. So you have to type in that passcode uh, in the very beginning when you try to enter the site, and then you can order one t-shirt for free, and you would only have to pay for the shipping. And with that being said. I would hand over to Mark because Mark um, is our presenter today and will show you procedural shading in Redshift again and also a little bit inside of Cinema 4D uh, when it comes to displacing objects. And yeah, take it away, Mark. Before Mark starts, sorry, the reminder, if you're asking questions in the um, in the Chad, please preface them with capitalized questions so we can uh, distinguish them from general comments. Thank you yeah. very much. And please uh, keep the questions on topic today, um, so we're um, so that Mark can answer them. So keep them procedural shading related, or at least Redshift related. That would be that would be great. All right. With that, okay. I'm gonna throw the screen at Mark. Yep, got it. So <laughs> thanks for the warm words and the introduction, Jonas. Me, myself, I'm a um, designer, I'm a 3D artist, I'm the founder and owner of Tiny But Nice Animation Studio Render Baron in the most western part of Germany, in Düsseldorf. And yeah, I'm doing Cinema 3D since release four, to be honest, since the early days of 1989. So it's been a while uh, since I'm comfortable with um, Cinema 4D. 
Yeah, and since a few years, I'm doing Redshift as well. Me, myself, I'm a Symphony master trainer, thankfully. And um, I will show you some serious procedural stuff today. Um, procedural shading with Redshift. And the topic of today's um, exploration in that matter is a procedural rock material, something like limestone, maybe. And for one of my past episodes on my YouTube channel, YouTube slash Renderburn, um, I did this image. And this is the material we are talking about today, a complex, more or less complex, procedural um, rock material. This is all procedural? You said? Everything completely, completely procedural. It's adjustable to the very last detail. And uh, yeah, no single uh, pixel was harmed. Uh, <laughs> procedural so we are, we are only harming samples here right <laughs> yeah <a lot laughs> of but it's it's quite fast to render though so um let's check what's in here we have obviously some albedo going on some um diffuse reflection we want to cover with our shading we have obviously some veiny structures going on coming from let's say volumetric structures on the inside of the volume of the rock we have some wear and tear on the edges, on the uh, on the edges of the of the rock, and we have some debris settling down from above. Obviously, here something like sand, something mossy coming from the sides. So that is something we will take care of in today's session. And yeah, let's jump right in. First of all, what we need is a geometry to shade. And in this case, the geometry comes from Quixel Megascans. It's very simple geometry. And um, natively, all things from Quixel is supposed to be displaced with um, render time displacement. So you have load a displacement map, um, and it gets displaced while render time. But <clears throat> we will do another approach. We just use the, um, the, the base geometry and displace it with a displace deformer on some classic shaders, and then do the shading in Redshift without Redshift displacement. The advantage of that workflow is um, you can rely on um, geometry aspects, let's say detecting a curvature of the geometry already without having to render things. You just have the geometrical deformation at hand in the viewport. So it's a little more, maybe a little more straightforward. So you see the deformation already in the viewport. So an alternative to um, uh, things coming from Quixel Megaskin is this side here, Polyheaven, for those of you who want to um, recreate this, it's also free, it's very high quality. And you see there's a base mesh going on and some displacement going on. And you can use all of these um, maps here, but you could also use just the base mesh and do the procedural shading stuff, which I will show you right now. So this is the base geometry. And to get a higher resolution for a better displacement, for a more detailed displacement via the displacer deformer, I formally um, subdivided that geometry, that very simple geometry. Let me just show you that. Just looking like that, very low poly. I subdivide that via a volume builder inside the volume measure, just a VDB um, with a signed distance field and uh, appropriate small sample size. Beware, that might take some time. But after you set up that for subdivision purposes, you just hit the key C and your mesh looks like that. Here we go. That's the smooth, subdivided um, base geometry. And um, from this on, we can go with a displacer. So what I will do now is to activate the displacer later on and then show some rock structures I create from scratch, completely procedural with classic shaders in Redshift. I won't do that later on. I will do it right now. So I will activate the displacer. Wait a little minute. Not, not a minute, a second. So there's the complete um, 
displacement. I will switch to another layout so you guys can see it a little bit better. Oh, and what you can fantastic. see here, pardon? It looks fantastic. Thank you. It's actually, it's not that complicated. Let's have a look in the displacer deformer. You can find the displacer deformer in the deformer menu. I have to search it all the time. Where is it? Displacer. Ah, here it is with that wavy uh, symbol, displacer. And inside the displacer, you can load shaders in the tab, shading, of course. And there is the, 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 the slot shader. And here you can load all sorts of classic Cinema 4D shaders. Why classic Cinema 4D shaders? Why not Redshift shaders? Because deformers can only deal, at least at the moment, with classic Cinema 4D shaders and not with Redshift shaders. I'm not sure if that will it's ever to come, but for now, it's only um, the classic shaders that are fitting inside the displaced deformer. So what's going on here is not too complicated. First of all, we need a container for things to layer up on each other. And that's the layer shader. You will find the layer shader in that menu here. Here's layer. And I already created one. If I click in there, we have a layer set up, maybe comparable to Photoshop layers. Um, inside the layer shader, you can just stack different ingredients, shaders in this case, and maybe mask them. So let me deactivate everything that's for a moment more or less superfluous. Let's just look what we have here as a very basic shader. That first layer is, when I click in there, we get inside a colorizer shader. And when I click in the content of the colorizer shader, there's just a Luca noise. So what we have here is a Luca noise. You can find it from the noise shaders uh, menu, a Luca noise. And that Luca noise is being put, let me just navigate one level up, inside a um, colorizer shader. You find both of them, colorizer, you find it here, and the noise shader you find here. So what is going on here? Well, when you put something inside a colorizer shader, it's basically the possibility to remap grayscale values. So you see here, you have a ramp here. And with that ramp, you can remap the grayscale um, weight. Let's say the grayscale weight, the weight of black, the weight of um, white inside the gradient by remapping the input values. In this case, it's a noise shader. And the noise shader, there's nothing else to it than I just dialed in a high global scale of 1200. I used the reference system world and I used a Luca noise, which is a fantastic noise for complex structures, maybe landscape piece structures, if you will, out of the box. So a cool noise inside the colorizer shader being remapped by that. That's it. I navigate up and that's my first layer in the displacer deformer already creating that complex structure. Please remember just a Luca noise inside the colorizer and you get this. It That's... definitely looks way more complex than just one shader. Yeah, it's this, pretty, pretty cool. At this moment, yeah. Yeah. So I allowed myself to add two more components to that. Um, oh, there's a typo. It should name this torture, not this trotter. That's um, unacceptable, unacceptable, Mark. You cannot have typos. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. My only criticism. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on top, we have another component here which is um, a combination of those words written here. It's a distorter shader. And inside the distorter shader, there's another time colorizer, but step by step. OK, when I click in here, you can see there's something going on here. Let me just um, turn it off again. Wait a little second. Yeah, that's our previous state. And when I add that up, I add that layer in multiply mode, and we get that rocky structures coming roughly from a distorted Voronoi tree noise. So let me click in there. We have a distorter here, a distorter shader, classic distorter shader. And the distorter shader is nothing else but, again, a noise inside the colorizer 
a little more contrasty, remat a little more contrasty, and being distorted by what's in there, a knacky noise. That's it. So naturally, those Voronoi free structures are completely linear. And by putting them in a distorter and distorting them with a knacky noise, you could use a turbulence noise as well. Um, we get a little more wiggly structures, as you can see in those uh, yeah, <laughs> wiggly structures represented here by the distort displaced deformer. So that's it. But for the moment, all these um, Voronoi structures, distorted and polarized Voronoi structures, are completely homogeneous uh, across the co complete rock structure here. So we want to mask that a little bit. And luckily, we have the possibility to mask that with a 3D gradient. And that's what's going on here. Below that structure I just showed you, there's another layer called simple a gradient. And when I click in there, there's a simple 3D gradient coming from the classic shader menu of Cinema 4D. And that 3D linear gradient is, is uh, adjusted from black to white and back to black in the direction of world Y. That's that pair of parameters here from zero to one meter and 50 centimeter. And what's that doing is by turning that layer to layer mask, it uses this gradient to mask the layer above, which I just showed you, the distorter with a colorized Voronoi. And the usage of this is, I'm just masking this distorter colorized Voronoi complex from uh, the point zero in the direction of world Y, that's up. Um, to, to, a, to a degree where it's not shown anymore. So we have only the, 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 the rock structures, we have only the rock structures slightly appearing above the ground and then disappearing before the top end of the rock. So that's the second component. And the third component is something similar. We also have a gradient, a 3D gradient masking things. And on top, there's just another time a colorizer with a knacky noise inside. Just look at the structures appearing now. Drum roll. Come on, where is it? it Take some time, maybe. It's active. Come on, show it to me. There should be some horizontally stretched um, structures, right? Yeah, there they are. Okay, there we go. Uh, um, horizontally stretched structures are also masked. Uh, at a certain uh, level of um, height of the rock structure. Yeah, that's it. That's my rock. And I'd say for further performance improvement, I put this thing as a child of my polygon and then do um, the command current state to object. By that, I'm baking literally that displacer in my geometry, so I don't have to wait for the displacer to perform anymore. So let me just switch that off. That's it. We have only a polygonal object with nothing to wait for anymore. It's just a high-res geometry already deformed, ready to be shaded. So if there are not any, if there are a little if there are any questions, now would be a good point because otherwise I will proceed with shading. Uh, so far, um, nothing in the nothing in the chat. But um, I just wanted to say that, especially that last layer that you added with the horizontal stripes, that's adding so much uh, naturalism to it. And again, yeah. it's uh, we we had that uh, a couple of weeks ago when Mark was here for the first time. Um, that just by by combining like three uh, noises, you can. Uh, achieve a result that is that is supernatural yes. and uh, this is a very uh, another very great example for exactly that thank you so now we have our structure and now it is time for a little bit of um analysis because i prepared pre prepared some <laughs> um imagery to have a look at in the picture viewer here we have some structures of a photographed 
I think it's a limestone of some sorts. And let's just let our eye rest on it and let's uh, let's analyze this a bit visually. So what do we have here? If we think in terms of computer graphics, we can separate things visible to the eye in certain categories. So we can categorize everything that's appearing to us here in the category albedo or diffuse shading. Further on, we can uh, categorize things that are seen here in the category of, let's say, damage or wear and tear. Also, we have the category maybe of sediment being settled on top of um, structures coming from above, so to say. So another category, of course, would be, um, let's think in terms of bump shading, maybe. Not doing everything with this place deformer, but also with um, bump shading from micro fake dis deformations. And we should definitely take care of the category of um, reflection and reflection roughness. So let's have a look for the uh, last point, reflection roughness, at the more steep viewing angles here. And what we can see here is that the reflection is obviously quite rough. It's quite widely spread across um, the geometry. So there's no really, uh, there's no crisp reflection going on here. And in terms of the first category I mentioned, let's move on to albedo. So what we have here as a, let's say, color background of the rock might be some more or less, yeah, maybe dull mm, a pattern of dark gray and mid gray and bright gray going on, maybe overlaid with some veiny structures penetrating the volume of the rock. So that would be our, let's say, albedo category. And on top, there would be some wear and tear. And yeah, we will categorize that while doing the shading as well, practically. So what I have here is a ready-made version of that rock shader, but we will delete that. We will just now have a look, an overview on what's going on here. And later on, I will delete that and we will create that from scratch, more or less from scratch. Maybe not that complex, but in general, we will recreate it. So what we have here is the color made of different ingredients. We have wear and tear, all the categories I mentioned while analyzing the photographed rock. We have some dirt and sand going on. We have a bump section with different ingredients, um, all of them piped into color layers, color layer node. And then we have, last but not least, some ramp for remapping um, reflection roughness information. All of that is piped into an output node via the redshift standard material. And we will recreate that now from scratch. What I will do now is press Control A and delete, my friends. So <laughs> now, how dare you? <laughs> well, we will have one, a little. Yeah, pause. I want to add one thing here. What, what you just saw um, in Mark's shader graph um, uh, was also the use of the new scaffolds and nodes that we now have in the node editor. And right. yeah, that, that was a perfect example um, how you can um, yeah, structure your your node layout so that it makes sense and um, yeah. Yeah, to, to add a few headlines and so on yeah. to, Very to important. have a good orientation when you come yeah. back like a few hours later or uh, days later or yeah, a year. Very also. important when doing complex stuff that you structurize and have, uh, keep to have an overview even months or years later so you don't have to struggle with uh, what did I do there. So um, I would rather than deleting everything, I rather create a new material so we can fall back on the um, original structure here if we have any problems. And I will just drag my new material on my existing geometry here. And from there on, we will 
take a small journey into shady. So what we have to do as a first step is take care of all those um, albedo structures we see, let's say, behind all those wear and tear behind all those veiny structures. So the first thing I will create is um, that dark gray to mid gray structure. Of course, I will need some usual suspects for that. I will use a Maxon noise node for that. Here, of course, I will use somehow a ramp node, maybe for remapping. I will definitely use a layer node Drag them in here. And maybe we will do some more. Yeah, let's let me add a mole, mul, mul, I don't know, multiply node for a little more sophisticated things with um, noise. So definitely we should start and fire up the render view to see what's going on. Give it a little time for digesting all the geometry here. And while we wait, preparing the scene, it's always a pleasure to watch status. Ray tracing hierarchy. It's a little bit, uh, it's definitely a big chunk of geometry, but we have um, that as right in the viewport. We don't have to wait for displacement shading. Going on. There is a question. Yeah. Um, will the project file be available? Um, no. That's the you... answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're doing this here because you have to do this for yourself and learn from it. And you can ask questions anytime or ask me via my YouTube channel. So you're free to do and follow along. So the key is to make the magic happen for yourself. So what we have here is let me just use another camera and navigate a little further to it so we have a closer look at what's going on. So first things first, I have to do a little structure here, do a color layer as the central point of my setup, maybe create some multiplication later on and connect the color layer node with the base color and connect the noise with the base layer of the color layer node. What we're seeing here is nothing because um, nothing's going on yet. We have layer one in our color layer node still active, so that's by default. Um, so we don't want that at right at the moment. So I'm turning that off and we see our noise going on here. Let me just navigate a little further away. And when I solo the noise, I will see it explicitly without anything around it. It's just like, like being plugged directly into the output node. So what we need as a basic structure for albedo is something that looks a little similar to the large scale details of rock that are going on here. And I'm talking about Voronoi structures. Voronoi structures that are roughly in the size or measurement of the large scale Voronoi structures you can see here coming from our displacer. So what I will do is dial in, in my noise menu, a displaced Voronoi. And I will give that displaced Voronoi structure, um, first of all, a reference source, which is the world reference source. So it's ref referring to the um, world axis, not to the object axis. And I will dial in um, quite a large scale of, let's say, um, let's try 500% maybe. That's way too big. So <laughs> OK, that's the experimental status of doing things live. So <laughs> let me check. When you cannot see the noise anymore, it's either it's too way too big or way too small. <laughs> yeah, it's way too, too big, still way too big. 
So here we go. So that was way too big. Okay, here we go. So that's what I meant with uh, shading structures that are roughly the size of the geometry structures. So as you can see, the geometry structures are roughly in the scale of the um, displaced Voronoi I just dialed in. So that's a good correlation maybe for the eye. Um, that's more or less up to your taste, but I prefer that way. So in the noise, I will dial in some um, dark gray and some light gray. So I have a nice variation of, um, uh, let's say a nice modulation of the geometry. And for now, I will deactivate um, the reflection of my geometry. So I can just see um, what's going on here in terms of albedo. So that's my first layer. And as another layer, I will maybe do something about those tiny structures we can see here. Let me just zoom in a little bit. We can see uh, large scale structures between dark gray and bright gray, and we can see tinier structures going on on top. So what I will do is create another noise, maxo noise, and we'll then adjust this to another style of noise. In this case, I will use, let's see, um, maybe a Voronoi 3, or maybe another time, a displaced Voronoi, but much smaller. So let me solo that and scale this down. It's already, all. it's almost OK. But let me just scale this down to, let's say, um, 0 0.4 and also uh, refer to the world axis. And then I will go to the um, output section of my noise and invert high clip and low clip. So I will get something like this, like those tiny dot structures, randomly looking dot structures. Maybe it's still a little too big. Maybe that's cool. So, okay. So I will plug that now inside my layer node in layer one. And let's have a look what's going on. I will activate layer one here and turn this to screen. So all my bright dots are on top of the aforementioned large scale displaced Voronoi. So, of course, that's much too much of that white dots. I have to lower opacity and maybe even mask them to certain areas. So what I will do now is create, you name it, another noise for masking this. So I will create a, let's say, more or less small scale turbulence noise. Go to the output section, narrow clipping. So we have a nice contrasty structures here. here, maybe not too bright at the white end. So all my white dots are not too bright because I will use this now as a mask by plugging this inside the mask part of layer one where just all my tiny little white dots were placed in. So let's have a look at soloing. Um, yeah, that looks much better. Maybe I will readjust uh, the low clip and maybe I just turn down brightness a little bit. So we have nice, not too homogeneous structures of white dots on top of my large scale displaced volume. So for now, that's cool. So on top, another time looking back at the reference, we have all this veiny stuff going on here. Let's have a look from the side. All those marble-like looking vein structures going on here. And um, these might look, to ha look hard to reproduce, but in, in fact, it's very simple to do. So what we need now is, you guess it, another maximoid node. Put that in, solo it and choose 
a different type of noise here. Screw up, noise type. And this time, I'm not using the uh, default Perlin noise, which is basically, yeah, it's a Perlin noise. It's called, just called noise, but it's Perlin, the, let's say, godfather of all noises. Um, no, I will use a turbulence. A turbulence is basically just a noise, a Perlin noise with more octaves, more, um, let's say, um, yeah, calculation iterations. So, but that's for another, another video. So I will use a turbulence and I will also use, of course, the world reference mode. So everything I'm doing here is volumetrically, volumetrically or difficult term, um, in terms of the um, referred to the axis of the world. So, okay, so I will scale up this thing. Let's try 40. And look, progress it out. It's Today, I'm going to scale too big. Let's do maybe six. Okay, that's looking cool. And I will again narrow my clipping here, my low clipping and high clipping. And what I will do now is that I'm going to another more, let's say, exotic sounding pyramid of noises. It's called cycles. And when I dial through cycles, I create something that's looking like this. Look at that. It's just, let me, let me bring the clipping to the default values so we can see it a little bit better. So when I'm cranking up cycles, my, um, my turbulence noise, which looks like this by default, gets that veiny structures more or less out of the box. So again, I'm dialing that cycles here. And you see that it's getting this veiny structures here. So what I will have to do right now is just invert the uh, levels of that. And I'm getting, let me just that. No, that's, that, that wasn't, that wasn't correct. I will have to invert the base colors of my noise. Let me show you that. I will turn black into white and white into black. Hopefully, I'm getting white veins. Uh, no. no, that's not successful. So let me revert that. I have an idea how to do that. It will be the first case of using a ramp node for remapping, ladies and gentlemen. So I will create a ramp node. So one thing that I want to add here is that um, this parameter is also great um, uh, if you want to use it in um, visual effects and uh, motion design. So what what I just saw when when the like the the evolution of that um, mm. of the noise when you when you played with the cycles parameter that that yeah. was cool, totally Thank cool you. effect. Thank you. And it's so simple. It's just <laughs> dragging a parameter basically. Yeah. So, um, just a sec. While you're drinking water, Mark, um, there was a question by Greg asking, yeah. um, it was asking, so far, these noises are spread across the geometry in a random way. Is there a node available to allow us to orient the values of the noise to the height of the geo, uh, dark and shallows, and, and so forth? What yes. I assume Greg is saying, and I replied, is that you can use procedural shaders to... Um, uh, mask these and change them. Are you going to show something with procedural shaders, AO, curvature, and all that? Uh, of course. I can. I, I will do some things with curvature later on, but uh, to mask um, s several shaders to the height or um, altitude of uh, the geometry, you can use um, a vertex attribute node and mm -hmm. utilize a field. So, um, and that session today i won't address this in particular particularly but you can see a video on that on my youtube channel called uh, creating 3d gradients it's about the fact that you can utilize fields via the vertex attribute node and by that create basically create uh, 3d gradients masking things to certain areas of objects so check this out thank you okay so but we will care about uh, curvature later on so 
What I will do now, I have to remap that rainy structure here because obviously I'm not getting anywhere by <laughs> inverting the base colors here or inverting the low clip, high clip here. Don't ask me why, it's a mathematical thing maybe. So I will just drag my wire inside the RAND node to Alt Input. Let me solo this. And I will click on the gradient and do a right click on that and say Invert Gradient. And that is Rum Row, hopefully inverting my gradients. It should, it should do. Otherwise, I lose my faith. So <laughs> I will um, change that here, the interpolation to cubic bias and the interpolation of the other node, not, not node, not uh, to cubic bias as well. And I will play with bias of the gradient. So what I just did is I inverted the grayscale values of my veiny structures looking like. So, into an inverted version looking like so. And why I chose um, the cubic bias interpolation method here, per not, please per not, um, is that you can, with cubic bias interpolation inside a ramp node, you can drag the bias to the opposite end of the ramp without getting. Um, Banding, <laughs> that's the term. Yeah, without getting banding. So if you would use smooth interpolation here instead, you would get a harsh edge in the ramp. So cubic bias to be chosen for each knot separately, keep that in mind, please, is doing a very soft a cubic um, interpolation of the ramp. So with this, I remap my maxon noise with all the cycles to a veiny structure. Now, long story, in short, I will plug this into my color layer shader. It is updating the geometry. And hopefully everything is still active. Yes. Phew. <laughs> Because updating geometry sometimes is a status where things freeze. So beware of that. So preparing ray tracing hierarchy. And we're progressive rendering. OK, we don't see that because we didn't activate layer 2 in our layer shader. Set it to screen as well. And there it is, way too strong. but. For now, that's cool. So what I will do now, let's say, let's let's uh, do this a little, or a little smaller, and let's bring that end of the ramp more to the left, so I we don't get too thick structures for that big um, wany structure structure thing. And what I need now is a copy of that masking noise we created for the bright dots by controlling, uh, hold control, click and drag. We copy that. And why do I copy that? Because I want to do another seed for this noise and mask my layer two with that different style of the um, noise here. Maybe not too harsh in its clipping and you get the sense of yeah that's the way i'm masking things here and that's the way um we created um a large scale veiny structures here on my more or less boring grayish dotty rock structure for the albedo category so that was one veiny structures to Put things in a nutshell, we don't have to create um, every single layer of wany structures that will follow. I will just copy my setup here, put that in layer three, activate layer three in the color layer node, set it to screen, 
then pluck the mask into layer three mask and you know the drill that will give us another layer of um, veiny structures but this time i will create small even smaller scale structures with a different seed so i'm creating a different version a smaller and different version of veiny structures here maybe even thinner in remapping terms and that is on top of my other aforementioned um, wane, wane structure. So let's have an overlook. So far, we have that wane structure going on here. We have the smaller wane structure going on here. Both of them are inside the color layer shader. Both of them are with in screen mode, blended. So here's the overall result. We can still play with um, the cycles um, inside the vein structures. Let's just try that and see what's going on. Wow, that's nice. Very defined, nice, thin, veiny structures. We can still play with the overall scale. And if you're not aware of this, um, when um, dialing in more scale here, you can push and hold Alt, the Alt key for dialing in um, What's that called? Nachkommastelle, Jonas. What's the term for this? Uh, float values. Float values. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's a little more defined and a little more uh, subtle if you make changes to the scale here. So that's roughly the principle of um, doing our video. Let me have a look inside my notes real quick if I missed something. No, for albedo, I think that's roughly all. So what I will add. As the last step here for your albedo category on top is a copy of maybe that tiny bright dots here. Hold control, drag and drop, put that in layer four color, go inside the color layer, activate layer four, set the layer mode to screen and do a little variation of that tiny dots, make them even smaller, um, vary the C value. And while we're in here, we don't need any mask for now. Just do this by um, the mask parameter, which is basically the opacity of that. And to adjust a tiny little touch of irregularity with that. So basically, that's what's going on here in our photographed reference, right? Yeah, that's pretty close. Hopefully. Absolutely. And, and again, I said it last time when, uh, when you were presenting here, um, that it's just amazing to see that you don't need too many layers to create yes. something out of the yeah, procedural noises that looks very realistic. Correct. That's so, no. the magic that's behind cool. it. If you go to, to, to the circus and see all the artists, um, jumping uh, to this below the ceiling of the circus, it looks very easy, and that's the art of doing things. It looks easy, and it makes complex things more or less maybe looking easy, but even if they're not. I do have a question. How yes. do we know that your reference is not just a rock you rendered using these <laughs> to make us I, think? I take because... that as a compliment. <laughs> Good point. Prove it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's because that's um, yeah. You have to believe me. I I think <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's taken with my smartphone. <laughs> so to finish things on the albedo side, um, I just use one of the masking noises I created as a mask for my layer four for those tiny dots. Plug it into mask, and. Do a little more variation on this, maybe. Ah, uh, man, it's too strong. Okay, do a copy. Do a little less low clipping. Do a little more brightness. Plug that in. Layer four. Mask. And of course, bury the seed a little bit. And I think we're good for now. So now it's time to save your work. <laughs> It's uh, at the latest point when you should say yeah. 
No so, backup, no mercy. Remember that, please. Yeah. So <laughs> what we have here is, uh, yeah, uh, a very basic setup for the albedo side of things in that rock. So what we need now is something that takes care of damages on the edges, takes care of wear and tear. So we have a node inside Redshift that is predestined for that. It's called the drum roll curvature node. A curvature node, it's something, let me call it simplified spoken, it's a derivative of ambient occlusion because it can sample on the inside on, of an object, basically on the, on the opposite side of surface normals, and by that create, um, it, it can detect where the object occludes itself. And while talking about occlusion, that's basically a term we know from ambient occlusion. So curvature is, let's say, something like ambient occlusion, inverted ambient occlusion on steroids, maybe. So let me show that and show you what's going on with curvature. It detects where the object occludes itself. And that is extremely useful when detecting edges or using that detection as a mask for other shading aspects like yeah, what else noise shaders of course so inside the curvature shader we can define a radius and what's even more important to that we can define that the curvature shader should only detect or only consider itself so only consider the object should only consider itself, not other objects. And that's also a hint that that technology is based on ambient inclusion because if you place a sphere or something else in there, it will be detected by the curvature shader by default. So we have to click consider same object only to do so. So we will lower, lower now the radius of that um, curvature. And what we see here is it doesn't do that much. So what I want to do is to get a clearer, more crispy result. I don't want all that curvature detection going on here. I want it to be, and that's the term, remapped. You know what's coming. You know the drill. Um, by a ramp node to have a more contrasty appearance. So ramp node connected. Oh, there's updating geometry going on. That's something where Redshift sometimes takes its time. Hopefully, yeah, infinite, not infinite time. So, okay, I will plug that into alt input, solo the ramp node. Waiting for preparing ray tracing hierarchy for measures. I have a question while you're wa waiting for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark, uh, I haven't tried it. So if you convert this uh, mesh object into a Redshift proxy and save it, mm -hmm. uh, is the Redshift proxy more optimized? So will these uh, changes to your textures make your preview go faster? It just came to me because I would have tested it. Do you have any experience on that? I only use Redshift proxy for scattering large amounts of geometry. And as far as I can tell, um, yes. Um, Redshift proxies do accelerate things, but only to my experience, only in terms of scattering. I may be wrong. It's been a while yeah, since I used that. Uh, that could um, be an interesting uh, quick tip. There you go. That's how ideas come. Yeah, Thank yeah, you maybe. myself for the question. Maybe. Another thing I was just thinking about, the, the uh, Redshift render view has these two buttons with the, uh, with the snowflake up there where you can freeze the geometry updates. Maybe that would help. Yeah, actually, there are no geometry updates going on here as we have a fixed geometry. But let's try this. Let's just try this. I will just finish my remapping work here. Just explain what I'm doing here. I just uh, narrowed the, um, the, the ramp I use for remapping the curvature shader. And create by this creating a very a much more harsher version of the um, of the curvature shading going on, and if I if I 
widen the curvature shader a little bit more. It should be even better. I do want to say though that it's so amazing that you can just use your a ramp um, yes. and you go from something very busy, very annoying to something that starts to even as it is. I mean, I would stop right there and say, mm -hmm. look at the black lava, you know, uh, but it's amazing. Just a ramp, you crunch it up and yeah, that's. Yeah, uh, the, the cool thing is we can use one and the same curvature shader here with different remapping nodes for different purposes. Let me just show you. I just created um, a version of my curvature shader that is only available or only visible, only visible on the let's say most exposed um, areas of the geometry here. So when I vary this with another version of my remapping ramp node, there's again updating geometry, time for questions. I will do the freeze geometry. I try that right now. I think everyone is mesmerized by, you know, <laughs> simplicity, you know you're just stacking up very simple concepts, how you get something which is indistinguishable from, from uh, reality. And I yeah. still think you rendered that rock. So, so okay. I, I often, I often got to the point where I thought, Hey, should I add another layer on top of that? Or am yeah, I, me too. am, am me I crazy too. when I do that? The answer is no, absolutely not. It will only add to the realism um, of the shader. Yes. So whenever you get to that point, the, the answer is at the, uh, at the extra layer. And maybe then even another one. Um, most of the time, it will help. Yes. So what I will do now is I just created a, a copy of my ramp node, plug it in there to alt input, and just play with in soloed, play with um, the ramp a little bit more, bring a little more detail back in it, and for now. Maybe that's that's cool. We have two variations now. We have that that little more fuzzy, much more detailed version of the curvature interpretation, and we have that uh, very harsh, um, let's say, uh, maximum interpretation of the curvature. So we plug, we will plug both inside. Let's say, uh, and either the the current layer shader, or let me have a look at my notes. Uh, a different layer shader. Let me just check. Oh, let's let's use a different layer shader because one limitation of the layer layer shader uh, node is we only can use up to seven layers. So whenever you think uh, I will throw around with layers, and you come to the point, should I open another layer node? Yes, maybe that helps because to tidy things up, and you're not running out of layers. So press C layer drag it in plug it together plug it in let's say layer one plug the other one in layer two solo the layer and check the um layer activity there we go do screen for the second one and lower its opacity and you can see now, while lowering the opacity to a very subtle amount, we get those minor structures literally in the background of the major structures. Major structures is that harsh ramp remapping of the curvature, and the minor structures are the subtle, is the subtle remapping of the curvature structures. Both of that in the layer shader. And now what we will do is plug that result. Inside our albedo, let's let's call it main layer node. We have layer five still available. Solo it. Go to the layer node. Activate it, and choose screen. And this should ah oh, very subtle, very subtle. You see that it's there, but still very subtle. So I will do something about that. Let me resolve the capture layer and do something about that 
very subtle structures, maybe like so. Bring more white back into the remapping. Make it a little more harsh, not too harsh. And maybe dial in a little more of the screened layer too and check back with the main albedo layer. Yeah, that's looking pretty good for now. Okay, any questions so far? There are no questions. Uh, Freddy loves uh, ramen noodles. Um, <laughs> other than that, uh, nothing. I, I think it, it's just that everyone is mesmerized because, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. Again, for me, stacking simplicity to create um, things that look real and extremely complex. Yes. Uh, for me, that's always the magic of uh, CG, that yes. each and every one of these things is so simple to understand. And all you have to do is stack them on top of each other with uh, a sort of, um, you know, eye towards precision. Look at your reference, think about what it's doing and try to emulate it using Correct. the simple stuff. Correct. That's, amazing. that's using the nerd or nerd at eye in, in, in everyday yeah. situations. If you walk down the street, see a stone like this, a tree bark or whatever, an asphalt, try to think what I, how would I do that? How would I reconstruct, reconstruct that in Cinema 4D and in Redshift um, especially? So that's a good um, everyday exercise for your brain to get used and to, be, to get comfortable with all those uh, shading aspects here. Do you take a lot of reference photos? So I, I know a lot of people in the industry, which, I mean, we all have a camera with us th uh, these yes. days uh, and constantly take photos of reference. Do you do that as well? No, uh, <laughs> only if it appears very beautiful to me, it has a little, let's say, um, po poetry of the moment. So that I will capture that. But um, normally, no, because I, I, I go to my, through my environment with, an, let's say, an open eye every, every time. So I keep that uh, <laughs> in my uh, recovery memory up here. <laughs> and, but, but, for, for, for very, very um, straightforward work, of course, I do take reference, like in this case, but I don't collect reference all the time. So, no, is the answer. Yeah, just before we uh, continue, I unfortunately, um, I have to leave, but I, I wanted to, to say uh, that what you created or recreated so far, it's just looking amazing. And I'm definitely going to catch up with the recording here to see you. um, how you finish that. Thank you. So um, have a great rest of the stream. And, Thank you. Uh, enjoy. Enjoy. Uh, we're, still gonna be here. Yeah, everyone, we're still going to be here. We're not going anywhere. We're going to overrun. Yeah. It's, just, it's, it's just me. We, uh, everyone else is overrunning as usual. The show is going on. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so talking of that, we have two components remaining for the, let's say, albedo side of things. The first thing is how do we create aspects of shading that are masked to a certain direction of the world? Let's say coming from above. On rock structures, we see sediment or we see things like dust or debris that are just on top on almost horizontal um, areas of the geometry. So how do we do that? Because that would make our uh, albedo even more interesting. So creating a fall-off shader is uh, a little shader setup work as we don't have a pre-made fall-off shader inside of Redshift. In contrary to the classic material system, we have such fall-off shader. But creating a fall-off shader is quite easy in Redshift. All we have to do is we need to detect where the normals of the geometry are looking to. We have to detect the state of normals. And for that, we create as the same named node, a state node. Can be so simple sometimes. <laughs> so here we have the state node, and it looks frightening, maybe. But the state node can detect, as you can see, the state of the normals. So when I solo that, 
we see, ah, look at that. There is some normal shading going on. And we have a reference space we can refer to, um, world object camera. We stick with world. That's OK for now, because we want to detect where normals of the geometry are deviating from the worldwide axis. So can I, can I make a quick comment here? Just, yeah. for, um, just a little segue, a technical segue. Uh, the three directions for x, y, and z are represented as the colors red, green, and blue. Correct. Just, just like your axes in your viewport. Yeah. Here in the in the upper part, you see the world axis green for y, red for x, and z uh, blue for z, and that's the representation uh, that's given by the state normal. But we will we will we will deal with that right now. So, actually, what we need as the next ingredients for building a simple follow shader, we just we just need uh, four nodes. It's not that complicated. And as a next node, we need something that is called a vector change range. Vector change vector change range. There we go. Drag it in here. And what we do now is just connect the normal output to the input of the vector change range. And inside the vector change range, I will um, change the old range minimum to minus one. That is because um, the normals of the um, from the from a state node should also pre-interpret it in the negative area to negative values. And at the same time, it's emphasizing the um, normals, uh, let's say the normals effect of that state node. Let me just show you what I'm meaning by adding another node called a color splitter node. And the color splitter node is here, drag it in. And we want, just to remind you, we want to detect world y axis in order to calculate the deviation of normals of our rock from that world y axis. And in, to do so, we need to split the output here to the basic colors of red, green, and blue. And that's what the color splitter node does. So in order to extract the green color from the so far uh, node setup, so far, I have to connect my vector change range to the color splitter node and add a ramp node to the green output. So what's happening now if I solo the ramp node is I get my green color information, which I can remap to a more narrow result. And by this, I am detecting the world y axis. So let me recap this. We have the state not detecting the direction where normals are looking. We change the range of normals from 0 to 1, like in the old range minimum to minus one. Oh, not that, minus one to plus one. And we split the result with a color splitter node and extract the green color because we want to detect the world y axis, green, with a ramp node. And you can see it already looks like snow. So snow is a perfect example from things coming from above. And now we can use this as a mask for anything, debris, Dust, what else? So our follow shader is now finished and ready for action. By the way, you can find a very detailed recap of that follow shader in my YouTube channel as a separate video creating a follow shader. Just go watch all his videos and get over it, right? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> it's as simple as that. There's absolutely no way that you will not learn a ton of things um well if you watch uh, mark's uh, videos and that i can guarantee because i i watch them very often <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay so what i need now is something to mask or play with it a little uh, let's 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 play with it a little um i will plug the result 
of my color shader to my layer shader we created so far. Let me just put it a little more up here and plug it into layer six because that's still available and play with it. Um, solo it. Progressive rendering. And it's not active yet, so I of definitely have to activate it, set the mode to screen. There we go. And lower the opacity to a good amount. You, you can see there's something of even more variation going on here. But just adding that um, fall off shader here, we add something like that looks a little like debris or chalk or dust settled on almost horizontal areas of the geometry. And you can still use that, or as well use that, as a mask for um, colored things. So let's create some dirt or maybe some sand by uh, creating just a Maxon used, uh, Maxon noise shader, just the usual, usual suspect. Um, give it a colored appearance, so it. Well, the appearance like maybe something dark brownish, not too saturated. So like so, even more desaturated, even darker. And I will do a right click, copy, right click, paste. And from there on, I will create a little variation, even more desaturated. And I will use instead of a noise, a Perlin noise, I will let's say, oh, let's use a FBM, which is basically a very tiny, crisp version of the Perlin noise with more octaves. Let's scale it down to 0 0.2, maybe something grainy going on here, maybe like so. And use this for being masked by the follow shader we just created. So plug it in layer seven of our um, color layer shader, color layer node, to be precise. Stole this, activate layer seven, and then use this ramp we have at the end of our follow shader as a mask for layer step and it's looking like so so that's a nice subtle uh use case here we have something like in the color maybe of our gravel on the ground going on here at the almost horizontal areas of our geometry and therefore blend both materials the gravel on the ground and the rock a little better together because in, in nature, it would be just like that. There would always be some dirt on almost horizontal areas. And for now, I think the albedo part, the albedo category of the rock is uh, covered sufficiently. So let's look how this is looking like with unsoloing everything. Take a sip of water. Okay, for now, it's not that bad. Not that bad. We're a little too close with the camera, so let's get further away. So everything's a little more crisp. We can, of course, increase details, but for now, we will do something more important because with that rock, we, we are dealing with a highly, a very rough structure. So this is being weathered and um, out in the weather and um, eroded over, over years and years and years. So that is a very rough surface. And inside the standard material node, we have something that is called a diffuse model. And the diffuse model is basically the step you take in shading before ever thinking about shading itself. You have to choose uh, a, an appropriate diffuse model that is also known as a so-called BSDF. And BSDF is the short term for 
bidirectional scattering distribution functions. Nothing else than mathematical function defining how light is spreading from the brightest point to the day-night area, so the so-called terminator. So how light is spread, how light is um, behaving, what's the character of light being spread from the brightest point to the darkest point. That's defined by a BSDF, in Redshift it's called diffuse model. And we have basically three models on board here. I don't want to go into much too much detail here, but we have um, by default a behavior that's perfect for slick, um, slick materials like glass like plastic, like um, everything natural, like, uh, I don't know, glass maybe. So that's called the Lambert diffuse model, but it's not shown here because we have no roughness going on here. And the diffuse default model called Oranaya without any roughness is basically Lambert for perfect Chinese structures. And you can imagine that for rock, that's not really appropriate. So. Okay, let's dial in some roughness then. Okay, yeah, then you get an Oranaya uh, diffuse model, but that's sometimes looking dull and boring, and you get tired of watching it. And yeah, we have something better. But in Cinema for this redshift, we have the diffuse model called Dion Lambertian spheres. It's so complicated to pronounce <laughs> that uh, you might forget about it, but actually that's one of the most sophisticated diffuse models I've seen so far. And it is made for rough structures, for structures with a lot of micro facets going on for rough structures, but made with the crispiness and the contrast of a Lambert diffuse model. And that's why you should use the Dion Lambertian spheres for everything that's very satinated, very or alloxated or just rough. So Dion Lambertian spheres. Um, by the way, developed by Eugene Dion at NVIDIA in 2021. So, okay, I mentioned there are two more components to go for the um, albedo side of the rock here. And these have to do with ambient occlusion, and the other thing we just created, the fall-off shaders. So we will add some ambient occlusion here to get some, let's say, dirt appearance in, in between where things occlude themselves. So I will create an ambient occlusion node. Drag it in. Solo it. And I'm disappointed because what? Because out of the box, ambient occlusion never does what it should because you, in almost none of the cases I use ambient occlusion, it's out of the box working like I want to. Let's have a look at the ambient occlusion node here in Redshift. We have three parameters to be balanced that are most important for using ambient occlusion. We have the spread. That's, let's say, the, the, the softness of the ambient occlusion ramp that's going on. We have the follow, that's, let's say, a weight towards the bright or the dark end of the softness. And we have that mysterious um, parameter that says max distance. And by default, out of the box, max distance is set to zero. And by that, it is sampling hemispherically where objects occlude each other but in a, let's say, more, more or less undefined distance. So if I raise max distance over zero, just a tiny bit, let's say one, it samples in real um, values. So in that case, yeah, we have to, <laughs> to approach um, our, our scene here a little more to see that effectively. It samples in one centimeter distance. So over, Beyond, beyond zero, everything is going in real distance values. So when I dial in, let's say one meter and 50 or 150 centimeters, I get finally um, the distance where ambient occlusion samples, uh, I get the distance I want for ambient occlusion to sample to detect where objects occlude themselves. But 
as you can see that ramp that's used between that let's say imaginative ramp between uh, the the most occluded point and the less occluded point is very soft so i need to remap ambient occlusion and remap if ambient occlusion can be a pain because if you create a ramp get in connect it out input solo it preparing materials and shaders progressive rendering there we go then you play with the ramp and nothing really happens and that is frustrating sometimes if you don't know why it's not happening and the reason for that is the technical background of the two render modes we have in in in, in redshift we currently we are in the uh, progressive render node uh, mode and the progressive random mode set, does a different sampling for ambient occlusion than the final random mode, which is called the bucket random mode and can be activated here and is definitely used for final rendering. And when I activate the bucket random mode here, you see that my remapping here is a little more defined and, and, and suddenly it seems to work. That's the surprising thing. So if you want to remap ambient occlusion, always check the result in bucket render mode. So as you can see here, we're now on the, on the successful side of things. Our remapping is working. And everything looks quite good at the moment. Just one more thing here. If you're out for very contrasty, uh, results with by uh, in, in for remapping ambient mean, occlusion, you should check the step interpolation of your ramp. So this gives you maximum contrast. I have also a video about um, enhancing ambient mean, occlusion in my um, YouTube channel. Of course, I do. So okay, so that's it. That's the dirt I want to add to my um, charts and and and. Uh, occluded regions of my rock. So that's looking pretty good. Let's add this to the um, you know, and as you can see, we just ran out of layers. So ladies and gentlemen, I have to create another layer node just um, for the sake of being a little more flexible. Um, drag this onto the existing connection between the standard material node and the already existing layer node. And I can drag that result of my remapped ambient occlusion in tiny layer one port, not so tiny anymore, and do a multiplication, a blend mode multiply. Uh, just a, is, uh, a note, if you may, uh, for anyone that didn't uh, notice, the output of the first color layer, we just put it as the color base layer in yes. the new color layer, and then you continue as if there's no problem. Any other layer you add on top of that, it's as if it's the ninth, 10th, 11th, and so forth. There's absolutely no difference. Yes. So one tip to, let's let's wait for the rendering here. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Beautifully remapped ambient occlusion in the occluded areas. Maybe a little too harsh um, fill light. Let me just do this a little, a little strong. So everything adds up nicely. And looking at the um, wires here, things can get a little complicated. So, how do you uh, keep your overview? of wires between nodes that are far apart from each other. Well, there's a very cheap trick to do so. Just right-click on a wire, say, create rerouter. Oh, no. <laughs> Just, uh, and grab your rerouter, and then maybe drag it to a position where it's more clear, visually spoken, for you what this wire does. So that's a nice way to 
um, keep things tidy a little bit. So let's get back to the main camera, check the intermediate result so far. And I think for now, the albedo is good. Let's just deactivate that. Fill light is a little, makes things a little too, too boring maybe. And let's deactivate bucket rendering as well for the sake of losing our remapping, the correct remapping of M and occlusion, but it speeds things up. And for final render results, we can turn it on again. So what I will do now as last two steps in our session today is create an appropriate uh, reflection roughness map and create an appropriate bump map for um, contemplating, uh, uh, compliment, <laughs> complementing uh, the, the actual displace deformation. So first things first, let, let's activate reflection because I turn it off in the first state, first steps during the first step of shading. Go to the standard material node, go to reflection and crank up the weight to one for now. And then let's see how to vary this bright, shiny, slick um, reflection. So what we have here is a reflection that can be varied with roughness. Um, by default, Redshift uses a so-called GGX reflection model for nice and smooth uh, tails of blurry or rough reflections. So we don't have to take care about this. It's been done under the hood. GGX, not Backman, not nothing, not anything else. GGX. What we want to do now is turn all those color information we created so far into a reflection roughness map to vary reflection. So we see if we crank up reflection, we get a more and more diffuse and non-viewing ang angle dependent reflection. But with only the roughness value being cranked up or dialed down, it's yeah, it's boring. There's no modulation in it. So we will use some more modulation. We will remap our color information with a ramp node, what else, to something that is useful for the reflection roughness. You see, the reflection roughness is a port here. I cannot navigate here, just a sec. Um, let me just, here we go. Where we are. Ah, the reflection roughness is a part here in the reflection stand uh, in the um, uh, redshift standard material node. And of course, this roughness can be varied with grayscale information. And we will do so. So I will connect my last layer node to this brand new ramp node, plug it in, as always into the alt input. And we'll use a derivate from that color information as a grayscale information for varying my reflection roughness. Why? I will tell you in a moment. So let me save my work. You should save more often, by the way. So um, let me fire up the render view again. Wait for things to come. So far, any questions? In the meantime, I can answer them. No, there, there was one question, uh, but um, requesting uh, requesting uh, clarification, um, but nothing else yet. If uh, we do have a, a question, I will let you know. That's cool. Thank you. So, waiting for things to happen. <clears throat> And here we go. So what I will do now, as I mentioned, I will turn my color information into something that's um, useful for color uh, for reflection roughness. So I will solo that remapping node, and for useful utilization of the, all the color information in here, we have to keep in mind how 
reflection roughness is working inside Redshift. When we want to use, no, when, when we want to define reflection roughness with grayscale values, as we were about to do now, we will have to know how grayscales are interpreted by reflection roughness. So a complete white will always be interpreted as 100% roughness. And a clear black it will always be interpreted as 0% roughness. Both are extremes we do not want. We want something intermediate that's more subtle, more elaborate. So we want something between a mid-gray and a more brightish gray, maybe if that's a term. So let's check this. OK, so this is um, the output so far. And let's think how we want to interpret um, all those grayscale values. So the darkest areas of that block are, of course, dirt coming from the remapped ambient occlusion. So that might be something that should have the most blurry reflection, as dirt is never something that's really crisp in terms of reflection. So, OK, black should not be remapped as black. Black should be remapped as white. So that's the first step we will take now. We will invert our gradient. So the darkest areas, the ambient occlusion in this case, gets the blurriest reflections. In this case, 100%. And the other extreme is the brightest areas, which are the um, curvature effects, the damage effects, and the veiny structures get the most crisp reflection. That's wrong as well. We do not want that as well. So what I will do now, I will adjust my um, ramp here from, let's say, um, let's say 70% roughness to, um, let's say, I will, I, will, I will go to the uh, black knot a little later. So what I did here is I changed the interpretation of my um, ramp here with this button to a linear interpretation. So I can re work with real values. So 70% white is like 70% um, roughness. So click OK. Do the same thing for the other extreme, the dark areas. Change the interpretation to linear and dial in, let's say, 30% maybe. Oh, that was too fast. I click OK too fast. So go back to linear. There we are, 30%. Click OK. That's it. So now we have an inverted version of our color information, grayscale from color information, and with not that harsh um, contrasts anymore. So let's plug this in, in the reflection roughness, and see what happens. So still, there's too crisp reflection going on. Let me let me go a little closer with the other camera. There we are. And now we can do adjustments inside the ramp. So let's do the brightest areas a little more diffuse. See that? More diffuse reflection. And let's do, yeah, maybe let's leave the dark areas here. And what you also can do is you can use the aforementioned remap ambient occlusion as well as um, reflection weight information. So let's do this. Let me pull that up here. So my distance, I have to, whoa, it's not, whoa. <laughs> Come on, here we go. Let's plug that remapped ambient occlusion inside the reflection weight. And this should mask out the dirt areas even a little more. Let's move the node back to its place. Maybe create a rerouter on the wire to have a clearer sight of what's going on.
yeah, something like that. So what we have here is we have two things going on. The color information so far created in that color layer setup is being transferred into grayscale, is being inverted in that ramp and used as reflection, a reflection roughness map or a shader, let's say that. And I also used a derivative of our remap M in occlusion for the reflection weight. So that's it for reflection and for albedo. What's left for now is the um, information we will create right now. Let me just let me just dial up a little more roughness here. It's just still too shiny here. And yeah, a little bit better maybe. Okay. So get back to the main camera. And we can still adjust all of the things we create so far, emit occlusion, the remapping of it. Everything is open and procedural, and that's the cool thing about it. Save your work. And as the last part of today's session, we will create a bump shader setup. Bump. It's, <laughs> it's just a nice term. Cool. OK, um, what do we need? Well, we saw in the very first part of our session here that remapped turbulence noises with a high cycles value where is it? Uh, are you cycles value are useful for that wany wane like structures? And we will now use a variation of this for creating, let's say, a shard like structure for um, for an overlaid bump shader. So just maybe three layers of bump. So we need layer node, of course, we need um let's say a copy of that turbulence cycles thing present control and hold control that's it um plug that into let's say layer one solo it and let's look how things are working i will go to that remapping thing here the ramp and just do things a little like that. So my veins are basically transformed into, uh, let's say, turbulent areas again. So that's not nothing else. I just pull all my two knots here, bring them up, and that's it. So let's do this again. Copy that. Plug it in. Uh, no, let's 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 just solo for now the the ramp node. Let's play with the seed of the contributing uh, noise. Yeah, looking like so. We will vary. Um, let's say the 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 levels of that remapping ramp, and we will repeat that two steps with another copy of the, both of them. So that vary the seed of the contributing noise. Maybe we can also vary the scale. And uh, maybe even do some variation here. A little less contrasting, maybe. A little bit more backwards to that veiny appearance. Let's grab all of this and pull it down here so our um, node setup still is tiny and clean. Tidy and clean, sorry. Uh, OK, and let's connect the ingredients we just created. So we have the color layer node here. We plug that. In layer 2, we plug the other component in layer 3. We activate both layers in the coloring node. Click, click. We set both of them to screen. We don't want them to be uh, masked by other things. We just lower their opacity 
by the mask um, parameter. So was that really a lot? Something weird is going on here. Let me check this. We have the color layer node. We have layer one in normal blend mode. That's correct. Looking like uh, so. Okay. We have color layer two on top in screen mode. Well, maybe try try something different. Maybe no. Just or just stick with normal mode mode, maybe. What I'm wondering right now is um to my mind, the areas with lower opacity should appear on top of this bright structure here. So as this this is not the case, let's lower the opacity of layer one as well, which is very tedious to do, but okay for now. It's okay for this outcome. Okay. And activate layer three and make it even less opaque. So what we have here now is a structure that we will use for bump information. And for bump information, it's always nice to have defined structures. So maybe let's narrow the knots of the contributing remapping ramp nodes a little bit more so our structures get sharper like so maybe maybe a little too harsh but we can play with that afterwards for now the principle is i think it's pretty clear re layering um layers of remapped noises and it should look like something like this maybe do it in normal mode and no that's not cool yeah maybe maybe something like that so what i'm going to do now is create a bump node bump map node to be precise plug in our color layer output so far into the texture input, the solo, and plug the whole bump map thing inside the uh, where is it? Inside the bump geometry, board. geometry bump. Halfway down, base properties. Just geometry under geometry. Uh, yeah, yeah. So okay, under geometry. It's halfway down. There you go. Bump map. There we go. And it should be there. Yeah, it is, but way too strong. So <laughs> we have to go to the bump map node and lower the height scale value to let's say zero point one. Still much too strong. Go to a little, go a little closer with the camera for a better evaluation. And still much too strong. Still, there's something going on. Maybe I will just use um, one of those noises directly inside the bump map to check if everything is all right so our noise is looking like this and it's plugged into the bump map the bump is in the standard material node and should look like this and as you can see there are tiny structures of bump going on here maybe i have things a little up So as you can see, we are introducing now 
noise-based structures, which are also completely procedural and are complementing our real geometry deformation. So why I layered, the reason why I layered this inside a layer shade is normally you get, of course, a more complex structure by layering things up, but maybe, um, I'm not sure if maybe the uh, frame buffer of redshift should be cleared and render view restarted. Sometimes things like this happen. So if that doesn't work, let's just stick with the simple noise inside the bump map. But you get the idea. You layer up structures that can be indefinitely varied by seed, by remapping, and by scale. And you get a structure that is much more complex than the sum of its uh, contributing parts. That's the, uh, the principle behind it. So let's wait for the um, rendering to start here. I can't wait for the day that cards are infinitely fast. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. So maybe it's also because of sharing the stream here that uh, um, things are not that fast as it used to be here with that card. It's an A6000, by the way, in here, RTX A6000. Okay, so you get the idea of layering things up. And now we have taken care of the albedo. We have taken care of the, um, let's say, interactive shading of detecting curvatures, detecting uh, world uh, axis directions. We have um, created some uh, dirt for um, for the the occluded parts of the geometry. We have created a bump map and a reflection roughness and a reflection weight map. And of course, that's not perfect for the moment because this is done live. You now have to adjust it in several iterations, maybe. But you get the idea of what in what in which direction this is going. So. As a last thing to do here is um, tidy things up a little bit with brand new features of uh, release 2024 of Cinema 4D's Redshift. And we have two nodes here that are helping massively for um, um, structuring complex shader setups. And the first thing is um, called the so called scaffold node. And when you drag that in, almost nothing happens, but that's tiny little thingy here. And the background of that is you have to drag, select and drag all those nodes you want to be at one, let's say, for the moment, folder. I have a tip for you, Mark. Yeah. Select them. Mm -hmm. Yes. I select them. Right click and say group in scaffold. Ah, was that, that available uh, before? Sorry? Was that available before the last update? Uh, this was from the, in, uh, the first uh, implementation of scaffolds. That, uh, okay. You can create your own. I mean, mm -hmm. it's uh, just a different workflow and drag them in. I'd like yeah. you to show both methods because it's yes, very good, yeah. So um, the first scaf scaf scaffold I will do is for the, let's say, albedo part of shading here. Let me select everything correlated to it and drag it into the scaffold. And that's it. We get the scaffold uh, blown up to the appropriate size. And we can double click on the title and say, OK, that's albedo. And the other method Tanasis mentioned was select your nodes. And instead of group nodes, which would be Alt G, we can use Control G, and that's it. Yeah, it's it's a little more complex. Uh, you more can complex. change the color. You know that you can change yeah. the color. You click on the scaffold. You can make it nice and bright, so you yeah. can see it from the background. It, it's very very handy, uh, both for C nodes and uh, Redshift nodes. So you can yeah. put things. Yeah. And there's a reason I'd like to explain you very briefly. Let's call this a beetle. Um, why I don't use so much um, grouping nodes. Because, of course, you can still 
group notes, as it's been the case with uh, even classical notes in the classical material system, since almost ages, no, for a few years now, you can say group notes, and then you get that tiny little node where all the former notes are grouped together. And to go in there, to, to, to edit them, you have to go in there. But it's definitely a question of taste, but to my taste, I'd like to work with completely open node um, uh, trees. So to go back, you have to click on that breadcrumb here, the, the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the parent structure of the, of the nodes. And to my mind, it's, um, it's a little more, I, I, I get the feeling of being over-engineered here at that point. So I'd like to work with um, completely open node trees and not with grouped node errors. So what I do now is ungroup the nodes, take a deep breath, be relaxed, and get my open nodes back again, and I can create a scaffold for them as well. So let's call this scaffold prompt, and that's it. So now that's the organization of that more or less a complex um, uh, shader structure here. One critics I have to um, have to give for my own work here is currently at the moment the rock looks a little too bright. It looks a little too uh, specular, a little too too shiny. We can adjust all of this procedurally, completely open with all of that parameter-driven shading aspects we just created in the last. Oh, okay, two hours. <laughs> um, but all of that is open. We're not fixed to anything. So we're now free to play with it all night long or until the client rings and wants the result. Yeah, and basically that's it from my side. Ah, one thing, one more thing. <laughs> um, if your structure by using scaffold is not enough for you, you can as well use another new feature of Redshift for 2024. It's called the Notes node. And that's very easy to explain because with Notes, you can just put note, notes wherever you like. And um, type in your information. Use, uh, type in, uh, I don't know, uh, Veiny structures, call it veiny. No. Pardon me, I have to type it in directly here. So place it in the appropriate area and have a little note what I, this part is doing. You can change the, uh, the font size, you can change the color. So it's yes. uh, quite, uh, yeah, you know, veiny. <laughs> Yeah. See, so you that's can... very useful if you have to zoom out from your complex um, shader setup. Yeah, from my side, that would be it for now. Can Are you there... please, can you do me a favor, Mark? Can you open yeah. the original one which you started? Yes. You yeah. show the viewers that just by uh, focusing on these techniques alone, how the final rock is going to look. Yes, I will just drag the final material, good point, Tennessee, um, on the geometry. Drag and drop, nice and easy. Do a rendering. No, that's not what I meant. You dragged the wrong one, I think. I think so, yes. You deleted it. Remember you deleted the... the... No, no, it's still, it's still here. Oh, it's the, the same one. Okay. It's still here. So, it's still looking a little too slick. Maybe, I think Redshift maybe has a hiccup right now. Let mm -hmm. me show you the final result as an image. As an image, yeah. Yes, and that's it. That's the shader you will get when, um, uh, let me go. Uh, sorry, sorry. Let me show it side by side. When you do something 
some steps like the one I showed you, maybe a little more iterations here and there, and then you get something out looking like this. We have all the steps I showed you, the debris in terms of world y-axis laying on top. You have the wanes, you have the curvatures, the damage uh, detection. You have all those tiny little structures coming from um, the bump complementing the real uh, deformation. Yeah, and that's basically it. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, there don't seem to be uh, any more questions. So with that, I'm going to do the closing housekeeping. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank uh, Mark. Uh, we're not going yet, so I'm going to do the housekeeping and say um, a few more formal goodbyes. So let me just... Uh, add my screen here and let's remove our beautiful heads and uh, very quickly remind you that for any events uh, of the past uh, the present and the future you can go to the max on events page and check them out um uh, a lot of interesting stuff going on and a really nice search engine with you know uh, time frames and regions and, and all that of course go and uh, subscribe to max on training team youtube channel where all these um, all these shows are being posted uh, after the, the live show. Even the ones that are viewed on the Maxon YouTube channel will be available for replay on the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. Uh, of course, go to the ZBrush YouTube channel that has absolutely stunning things uh, to check things out. Um, if you want to become a Pro Certified user or OA Certified Trainer, go to the certification page, check out the certification topics list, and uh, you can even do an elementary uh, knowledge test uh, online to just uh, to see how good you're doing, and uh, it's fun in any case. And uh, you go here to get your free T-shirt. If you look at the the chat, you will find both this address and the passcode for the month of October. And don't forget, go to Cineversity, uh, the new Cineversity.maxon.net and the old Cineversity.com uh, to watch, uh, I think, uh, something like more than 10,000 videos. Uh, don't forget to go and watch uh, uh, Mark's tutorials. Uh, he has, if you liked today's show, you're going to be amazed with what he's done um, with Redshift and even in the past, just by using a uh, standard renderer. In Cinema 4D. Um, his tutorials are always amazing. And uh, with that said, here we are. <clears throat> and uh, again, I'd like to thank you, Mark, for being here. So thanks the for way having me. The images are, I'm going to turn this way. All right, let's see. So, Mark, thank you very much for coming. I hope thank I'm Thank you for having you. me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> it was a pleasure always. And uh, yes, thank you everyone for uh, watching the show and I uh, wish you a very great rest of the week to all and an upcoming uh, weekend. Now I have to go and click some buttons here to make sure that we get the closing of the show. If I, if I close using another show's closer, uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm not very uh, good at this. So uh, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.